Police are searching for a six-foot-tall man with dark curly hair and badly stained teeth, dubbed the Night Stalker, who may have committed 13 murders and 12 grisly assaults in the San Gabriel and San Fernando Valley since February. The crimes are different, but the method is always the same. He enters private homes at night through an unlocked door or open window and hunts down his prey while they sleep. Aside from the nature of entry, uh, the approximate time of day that entry is made, Beyond that, it's difficult to categorize them. Victims range between the ages of 16 and 80, from women alone to couples with children. Some have been strangled, some shot. Most of the women have been raped. What baffles police is that the attacks are random. It's like having our neighborhood raped itself. Someone violated our sanctuary. I've left my windows open before, but not anymore. Gun stores report they can't keep handguns in stock. I want to be able to defend myself. He doesn't make any substantial efforts to choose a victim and then do whatever it takes to enter. Uh, he seems to enter whenever entry is easy. The horror began in June 1984. Los Angeles was under siege. Death waited in the dark at the hands of a man they called the Night Stalker. After a 14-month reign of terror, he was finally caught. It was only then that his true identity was discovered. His name, Richard Ramirez. Richard Ramirez's whole trip was to hide in a tree or hide behind a fence and watch his victims at nighttime and wait into the wee hours of the night. And then while they slept, creep in, you know, like a coward and, and kill him. A serial killer comes about by circumstances and like a, a recipe, poverty, drugs, child abuse. These things, you know, are, contribute to a person uh, to a person's frustration and anger and, uh, and uh, at a, some point in life, he explodes. He took a, a woman in her 60s and stomped her to death with his foot, leaving an imprint of a shoe on the side of her face. Uh, from that to just executing somebody upon walking into a room after he entered a house. He strangled, he used a ligature, he used a tire iron on a, on a young girl. A beater left her for dead. I think most humans have in them the capacity to, co to commit murder. Uh, it is no, not because... No, we don't, Richard. Uh, they, they choose not to, not because they are morally superior, as they so commonly claim, but because they are imprisoned in a web of responsibilities, commitments, no, beliefs, and sentiments. Richard, Richard. And that would render murder an absurd gamble or ridiculous well, self-destruction. Who are you? Just a guy. Just a guy. When I was young, when I was like, like five, six, uh, I, I opened the curtains and outside the window there was a monster, big hairy monster. <laughs> and did they, did like he tell you to do anything? No, I mean I used to get scared, scared a lot. Was your cousin an influence on you? Yes, I look up to him. Because when you're at that age, you know, superheroes, war heroes are like in comic books, TV. This he was vicious, mean, strong, you know. I didn't mind seeing all that gore and violence. It was a turn up, it was exciting. He used to say, there's no thrill like a good kill. <laughs> And, uh, feast on bones. Born in El Paso, Texas, Ricardo Leva Munoz Ramirez was the youngest of five children. His father, a Mexican national and former policeman, was an alcoholic who was prone to fits of anger that often resulted in physical abuse towards his wife and children. Psychiatrist Michael Stone describes Ramirez as a made psychopath as opposed to a born psychopath. Ramirez was knocked unconscious and almost died on multiple occasions before he was six years old, and as a result, later developed temporal lobe epilepsy, aggressivity, and hypersexuality. Ramirez began smoking marijuana and drinking alcohol at the age of 10. At age 12, 
Ramirez was taken under the wing of his elder cousin, Miguel Mike Ramirez, a decorated Green Beret who himself had already become a serial killer and a rapist during his service in the Vietnam War. Mike often boasted of committing brutal war crimes and shared Polaroid photos with Ramirez showing Vietnamese women whom he had raped, murdered, and dismembered or decapitated. Mike taught his young cousin some of his military skills, including stealth and kill tactics. Ramirez was present on May 4, 1973, when Mike fatally shot his wife, Jessie, in the face with a handgun during a domestic argument. Like the graphic photos and stories of his cousin's war crimes in Vietnam, Ramirez would later similarly remark that witnessing the murder was not traumatic for him in any traditional sense, but rather a subject of fascination. After the shooting, Ramirez became sullen and withdrawn from his family and peers. Mike was later found not guilty of Jesse's murder by reason of insanity, with the shooting attributed to post-traumatic stress disorder from his military service. He was confined for some years at the Texas State Mental Hospital. Shortly after the shooting, Ramirez moved in with his older sister, Ruth, and her husband, Roberto, an obsessive peeping Tom who took Ramirez along on his nocturnal exploits. After Mike was released from the mental hospital, he sometimes accompanied Ramirez and Roberto on these voyeuristic walks, spying on women in the nearby areas through their windows. By the time Ramirez had turned 14 in early 1974, he began using LSD frequently. He and Mike resumed bonding over their shared use of drugs and alcohol. It was during this period that Ramirez began to cultivate an interest in Satanism and the occult. When he reached adolescence, Ramirez began to meld his sexual fantasies with graphic violence, including forced bondage, murder, mutilation, and rape. While still in school, he took a job at a local Holiday Inn and used his master key to rob sleeping patrons. On at least one occasion, Ramirez molested two children in an elevator at the hotel, but he was never reported or prosecuted for this act. His employment ended abruptly after Ramirez attempted to rape a woman in her hotel room and was caught in the act by the victim's husband. Although the husband beat Ramirez at the scene, criminal charges were dropped when the couple, who lived out of state, declined to return to Texas to testify against him. It was a sunny day. I had been with Mike that day, hanging out, and uh, he got to his house about 3 p.m. He went and got the gun from the top of the refrigerator and got close to her and blew her head off. Right here. Where she saw everything. It, it struck me that she was dead, you know, because I knew her pretty good. Death had a very profound effect on me when I saw it. Serial killers do on a small scale what governments do on a large one. They are a product of the times, and these are bloodthirsty times. Even psychopaths have emotions if you dig deep enough. But then again, maybe they don't. Do you have emotions, Richard? No comment. Tell me what kind of emotions you have going through you right now. I'll tell you what, I gave up on love and happiness a long time ago. People. People in this day and age are brainwashed and programmed like a computer at being nothing more than puppets. This nation, this country is founded in violence. <sighs> violent delights tend to have violent ends. It's Madness is something rare in individuals, but in groups, people, and ages, it is a rule. Killing is killing, whether done for duty, profit, or fun. Men murdered themselves into this democracy. In 1982, at age 22, he moved to and settled permanently in California. It was around this time that Ramirez got heavily addicted to cocaine and began to commit theft and burglaries to procure money for sustaining his addiction. He lived nomadically between San Francisco and Los Angeles County. On April 10, 1984, Ramirez murdered Mei Leung, a nine-year-old Chinese-American girl in the basement of his apartment building in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco. Leung was with her eight-year-old brother and looking for a lost one-dollar bill when Ramirez approached the girl and told her to follow him into the basement to find it. Once they were in the basement, Ramirez beat, strangled, and raped Leung before stabbing her to death with a switchblade, hanging her partially nude body from a pipe by her blouse. Ramirez broke into a home in Sierra Madre and bludgeoned 16-year-old Whitney Bennett with a tire iron as she slept in her bedroom. 
After searching in vain for a knife in the kitchen, Ramirez tried to strangle the girl with a telephone cord. He stated that he was startled to see electrical sparks emanate from the cord. And when his victim began to breathe, he fled the house believing that Jesus Christ had intervened to save her. Bennett survived the attack. On July 7th, Ramirez burglarized the home of 60-year-old Joyce Lucille Nelson in Monterey Park. Finding her asleep on her living room couch, he beat her to death by stomping on her face repeatedly. A shoe print from an Avia sneaker was left imprinted on her face. After cruising two other neighborhoods, he returned to Monterey Park and chose the home of Sophie Dickman, age 63. Ramirez assaulted and handcuffed Dickman at gunpoint, attempted to rape her and stole her jewelry. When she swore to him that he had taken everything of value, he told her to swear on Satan. Two weeks later, on July 20th, Ramirez purchased a machete before driving a stolen Toyota to Glendale. He chose the home of 66-year-old Layla Needing and her husband, 68-year-old Maxon Needing. He burst into the sleeping couple's bedroom and hacked them with the machete, then killed them with shots to the head from a 22 caliber handgun. He further mutilated their bodies with the machete before robbing the house of valuables. After quickly fencing the stolen items, Ramirez drove to Sun Valley, Los Angeles and broke into the home of the Covenanth family. He shot the sleeping 32-year-old Chainerong Covenanth in the head with a 22 caliber handgun killing him instantly, then repeatedly raped and beat 32-year-old Samkid Kovananth. He bound the couple's eight-year-old son before dragging Samkid around the house to reveal the location of any valuable items, which he stole. During his assault, he demanded that she swear to Satan that she was not hiding any money from him. On August 6, 1985, Ramirez drove to Northridge and broke into the home of 30-year-old Chris Peterson and Virginia Peterson, age 27. He crept into the bedroom, startled Virginia, and shot her in the face with a 25 caliber semi-automatic handgun. He then shot Chris in the neck and attempted to flee. Chris fought back, while avoiding being hit by two more shots during the struggle before Ramirez managed to escape. The couple survived their injuries. Two nights later, Ramirez drove a stolen car to Diamond Bar and chose the home of Sakina Abawath, age 27, and her husband, 31-year-old Elias Abawath. Sometime after 2.30 a.m., he entered the house and went into the master bedroom. He instantly killed the sleeping Elias with a shot to the head from a 25 caliber handgun. He then handcuffed and beat Sakina while forcing her to reveal the locations of the family's jewelry and then brutally raped her. He repeatedly demanded that she swear on Satan that she would not scream during his assaults. Ramirez left Los Angeles and headed to San Francisco. On August 18, he entered the home of 66-year-old Peter Pan and 62-year-old Barbary Pan. He shot the sleeping Peter in the temple with a 25 caliber handgun, killing him instantly. He then beat and sexually assaulted Barbara before shooting her in the head and leaving her for dead. At the crime scene, Ramirez used lipstick to scrawl a pentagram and the phrase, Jack the Knife on the bedroom wall. He again left a shoe print at the scene that detectives discovered and matched to a specific pair of Avia shoes that was not common at the time. On August 30, 1985, Ramirez took a bus to Tucson, Arizona to visit his brother. Unaware that he had become the lead story in virtually every major newspaper and television news program across California. After failing to meet his brother due to his not being home, he returned to Los Angeles early on the morning of August 31st. He walked past police officers, who were staking out the bus terminal in hopes of catching the killer should he attempt to flee on an outbound bus and into a convenience store in East Los Angeles. After noticing a group of elderly Hispanic women fearfully identifying him as El Matador, Ramirez saw his face on the front page of the newspaper La Opinion with a headline calling him Invasor Nocturno and fled the store in a panic. After running across the Santa Ana freeway, he attempted to carjack an unlocked Ford Mustang, but was pulled out by angry residents. Ramirez ran across the street and attempted to take car keys from Angelina de la Torre. Her husband, Manuel de la Torre, witnessed the attempt and struck Ramirez over the head with a fence post in the pursuit. A group of over 10 residents, including Jose Burgoyne's sons, formed and chased Ramirez down Hubbard Street in Boyle Heights. They soon restrained Ramirez and relentlessly beat him, 
At around 8 a.m., police were called over a disturbance in the area with few details with indications of a fight. Police quickly arrived on Hubbard Street and took a severely beaten Ramirez into custody. Central Jail, been charged with one count of murder. The man who allegedly terrorized Los Angeles and Orange Counties and the city of San Francisco was captured this morning in the Hollenbeck area of East Los Angeles. He was first seen at around 8.30 near a liquor store in the Midtown area looking at his picture in the newspaper. Later he was spotted by citizens who called police. He was walking in the Hollenbeck area neighborhood. In a news conference this afternoon, Commander Booth said the local citizens were reporting every step taken by the man and every direction change. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few moments, several men will appear on the stage. Each man will be assigned a number and will be referred to only by number. Number two, step to the red square in the center of the line. Number two, in a loud, clear voice, repeat this statement. Shut up, bitch. Shut up, bitch. Number two, turn to your right and face the door. The guy came at me with a, a piece of iron bar, and he hit me once over the head. I turned around, and he swung it again, and he hit me on the wrist. They risk their own selves to go after him. They did not know whether he had a weapon. They were heroes. And at that point, I couldn't run anymore. I sat down to take a breather, and I saw a sheriff's patrol car coming down the street, and I knew that, you know, my life was over. Ramirez waited in jail as his trial was continuously pushed off, the delay marked by a series of motions and bickering between the prosecutors and defense attorney. Because the geographical spread of the crimes also complicated the scope of the trial with jurisdictional issues. Some of the charges against Ramirez were dropped in order to expedite what was becoming a long journey to justice. The jury selection process finally moved forward on July 22, 1988, and the trial itself commenced the following January. During this time, Ramirez attracted a cult-like following of supporters, many of whom were black-clad Satan worshippers. Ramirez himself often dressed in black, along with dark shades for his courtroom appearances. Yet another delay occurred when one juror was found murdered on August 14, 1989, but rumors that Ramirez had orchestrated her death proved unfounded. On September 20, 1989, the jury finally returned a unanimous guilty verdict on 43 charges, including 13 counts of murder, 5 counts of attempted murder, 11 sexual assault charges, and 14 burglary charges. Two weeks later, the same jury recommended the death sentence on 19 counts. Leaving the courtroom, Ramirez responded. A big deal. Death always went with the territories. I'll see you in Disneyland. The convicted murderer was formally sentenced to death by gas chamber on November 7, 1989, and was sent to San Quentin Prison in California to spend the remainder of his days. This trial is a joke. <laughs> with the jury in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Richard Ramirez, guilty of murder. We are all evil in some form or another, are we not? Did you kill 13 people? It would be improper for me to comment 
on my LA convictions and on my pending case here in San Francisco. Why? Because of my appeals. Are you appealing these because you say you're innocent? You didn't kill 13 people? That is correct. You didn't kill 13 people? Again, it would be improper for me to comment in any regard to that question. I did start seeing something going wrong with R Ricky Ramirez. I think what really messed him up was the acid. He would do a lot of... Since his arrival at the San Francisco jail, women from around the country, including one of the female jurors who had found him guilty in Los Angeles, had been flocking to the San Francisco facility, even fighting with each other over Richard's affections. I have friends. And that is all I care to say, really. They are open-minded people. A lot was made that you're a devil worshiper. You worship the devil? Have you ever studied Satanism? <sighs> there are different sects of Satanism. Have you studied, just yes or no, have you studied yes, Satanism? Yes, yes I have. Are you, are you a worshiper of the devil? No comment. Come on, Richard. We're I can tell you a little bit about Satanism. Well, I'm, I'm interested in hearing what you got to say then. It is undefiled wisdom instead of hypocritical self-deceit. <sighs> it is power, power without charity. A Satanist admits to being evil. Do you admit to being evil, Richard? We are all evil in some form or another, are we not? I'm asking you the questions, my friend. <laughs> yes, I am evil. Not 100%, but I am evil. Evil has always existed. The perfect world most people seek shall never come to pass, and it's going to get worse. <sighs> the great epoch of our life is when we gain the courage to rebaptize our e evil qualities as being our best qualities. As far as Satan is concerned, I, I believe uh, in a malevolent being. Uh, his description eludes me, but I, I have felt powers that are evil.